Hello, a very warm welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm Sanam Shantier. Coming up on this week's show, Yemen. Two years of civil conflict, 10,000 civilians dead, over 3 million people displaced, a nation on the brink of famine. One of the world's biggest engineering projects as car craze Qatar braces itself for a metro system. But will anyone actually use it? Also coming up, from Syria to France, refugees of rap. A hip-hop band who sing about the Assad regime, life in exile and freedom. Yasser Jamus will be joining us in the studio. But first, two years on and the civil war in Yemen shows little signs of easing. To commemorate the anniversary, thousands of pro-Houthi Yemenis took to the streets of the capital on Sunday to call for an end to the conflict which has killed more than 10,000 civilians. According to the United Nations, some three million people have been displaced and the country is on the brink of famine. Anka Ula has the details. Two years of war between pro-government forces and Iran-allied Houthi rebels. Two years of airstrikes by the Saudi-led coalition of Gulf states. And nearly 8,000 deaths in Yemen, half of which are civilians. But this balance sheet is just provisional. Millions of people in the Middle East's poorest country are still in danger due to a humanitarian crisis that broke out during the conflict. Seven million people are facing famine. 17 million suffer from food insecurity. And 14 million have no access to drinking water. And you know as well as I do that uh, the availability of food in the markets and the food prices because of the fuel crisis is also uh, having a big impact on normal people's lives. The fuel crisis affects not only transportation, but all the country's infrastructure. In this nutritional clinic, generators are often out of order, and machines sit idle. The problem stems from the blockade. Before the conflict began, Yemen imported 90 percent of its food. But to smoke out the Houthis, the coalition took control of their naval and aerial supply routes. We want to bring in uh, some important supplies to help uh, the civilian population, but we are increasingly in a difficult situation in order to do so. The most vulnerable Yemenis are hit the hardest. According to the UN Children's Agency, almost half a million children are severely malnourished. The number of children injured and recruited into the conflict has nearly doubled in the past year. Certain NGOs are already calling them a lost generation. Up next, an Egyptian court has sentenced 56 people to prison over the capsizing of a boat that killed over 200 people. This was one of the deadliest disasters in the dangerous Mediterranean crossings of migrants to Europe. After the Balkan route was effectively shut down and Libya descended into chaos, Egypt has emerged as a new gateway to Europe for immigrants from Africa and the Middle East. But Egyptians also make illegal crossings into Italy in search of a better life, many ending up behind bars. Siham Hamdi is worried about her son who disappeared a few months ago without saying a word. For two days, I couldn't find anyone who knew where he was. Then some people came and told me that my son had gone to Italy, on a boat. I asked why. They said because he couldn't find a job here and couldn't make a living. When news of his whereabouts finally came, it wasn't good. He called me about two months ago, telling me he was in prison there and that he didn't know why. He was crying the whole time. He said he would call again in 15 days, but we haven't heard from him since. Residents of this fishing village near Alexandria say they're seeing an exodus of young men crossing the Mediterranean in search of a better life. Most of the time, the migrants pay more than $1,000 to be crammed into boats that are barely seaworthy. You sit next to some young men in the evening, and the next morning you hear they're gone. Where? To Italy. The smugglers put more than 300, 400 people in a boat, which is not even as big as this room. Many who survived the dangerous crossings get arrested even before they set foot on Italian soil. Mustafa Al Said spent more than a year and a half in Italian prison after two failed attempts, but that hasn't put him off the idea. I went to Italy twice, and like any other young men anywhere else in the world who can't get work or make a living, I might try to go again. 
According to the EU border agency Frontex, more than 12,000 migrants arrived in Italy from Egypt in the first nine months of 2016, almost doubling from the previous year. Egyptian authorities have done little to deter smugglers, and locals often don't inform on the illegal activities out of fear of the police. Now, since 2013, a workforce of 41,000 has been digging, tunneling and building. All this for one of Qatar's biggest, possibly riskiest ventures. That's, of course, the ultra-modern metro system. And once completed, it will run hundreds of kilometers across Doha, the coast and the suburbs. But whether it will actually be used by the car-crazed nation is another question. In this government-run workshop in Doha, today's lesson is how to use the metro. Will there be parking spaces near some stations? There will be shuttles at stations without parking spaces. Qatar's first metro is due to open in the capital in 2020, two years ahead of the Football World Cup. The project cost $18 billion and includes three underground metro lines. Doha's population has tripled in the last decade, creating a traffic problem. I'm very confident that the, the metro will be a hit. It takes me approximately one hour every day to go from work. So for the metro, you have a safe and uh, dependable uh, transportation to reach from, one, from point A to point B. And the, and, the, uh, and the time is fixed. Qatar Rail, the governmental company that runs the project, and the Ministry of Education have launched a vast awareness-raising campaign. The metro is even mentioned in school books. Uh, unfortunately, to change this culture, it will take time. They started in the Ministry of Education now to insert some information about uh, uh, Qatar Rail. We started, even ourselves, like today, given presentations, we given the attractive point to them. Each month, some 20 people die from road accidents in Qatar, out of a population of 2 million. But because there aren't any other options, cars are still the main mode of transportation in Qatar for those who can afford it. I think uh, I will use the metro, the Filipino, the Indians, the Nepal, because uh, they don't have car. Authorities hope their costly infrastructure projects, such as the Doha Metro, will remain popular even after the Football World Cup. Now we'll bring you the story of two brothers who grew up officially stateless in a Palestinian refugee camp in Syria before they escaped for their new life here in France back in 2013, where along with their identity, they found their voice. Today, Yasser and Mohammed Jamus rap about freedom and life under the Bashar al-Assad regime, but not without the fear of repercussions. We're joined in the studio by Yasser. That's one member of Refugees of Rap. But let's start by taking a listen to one of their songs, Ayam al Ghurba, or Days in Exile in English. Yeah, so thanks for joining us. Uh, Refugees of Rap, that's a really interesting name. It already says a lot about the group, even if we don't know about the history. Thank you very much. Actually, yeah, uh, Refugees of Rap it was uh, the name we have used, we have been chosen because actually we find that the rap music is the place and the country that we can uh, do asylum there and ask to be refugees there and say whatever we want. So that was the idea of uh, being refugees to rap. And also when we started the group, we was uh, four and different country. That mean from Algeria, from Syria, from Palestine. So we said, we don't want to give a nationality to this group. We want to just to be human on it. And yeah, let's take it to be all together refugees to this music. Now, how did you get around rapping in Syria whilst actually understanding that there are a lot of restrictions and there is censorship? Yeah, actually, this is, was one of the hardest thing uh, to do. Why? Because every time we write something, we have to read it again and again and try to edit it. That means one word, it's called 
cost you like prison sometimes, you know, and maybe uh, killed. So we trying with metaphor and to send some messages was indirect. That mean not directly about the regime, but about the situation, you know. So you don't have to be so indirect here. You're talking about the regime. You're singing about your life in exile. What kind of a fan base, what kind of a following do you have here? Uh, today, our fan base, it's like uh, changed than before because when we was in Syria, we had, you know, uh, all the people who like rap music, like uh, our group. But today, our fan base is the people who like our music and who live our life, you know. I mean, like, who live the same life we live in exile or in the opinion of freedom. You talk about freedom, but there have been some kind of threats on social media towards refugees of rap. Yeah, that was right. In 2012, we got some threats. And that was the reason that we um, we had to quit Syria because, you know, we choose to uh, do music. And music is our weapon. We don't want to fight there, you know, uh, with arms. We, we choose music and... To choose music, that was the tax for it, you know, to be exiled. Yasser from Refugees of Rap, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Now that's it for this edition of Middle East Matters. Don't forget to follow us on both Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for watching.